Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. And before we get started, uh, before we get started, make sure you smash that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel even better. Spread the word to your friends about, well, the best wine show anywhere. All right, it's great to be back on the set. I have a set of six wines from Chile featuring the grape Carmenere. First, it's pronounced Carmenere, not Carmenere. It's a French word and there's no tilde over the end. Got it? Cool. Uh, also, I just wanna see what happens. I'm going old school with the green green screen rather than the blue green, you know, the blue screen because none of these bottles have green. Matter of fact, um, this bottle is blue, so I have to keep it green, uh, but that's not gonna be till the very end. You're gonna see this in about six weeks. Anyway, uh, I wanna see what happens here. This is a bluish green water bottle and I always avoid using it. Something else to make note of, in Chile, there isn't a single standard concerning the spelling of Carmenere. You'll see it three ways. Uh, the first, the French way with both accent marks, uh, then with just the accent mark over the second E and then no accents. The, this label, has no accents, yet the text sheet has an accent over the second E. For the series, I'll use the French way for all titles and description, but for wine stats, I'll use it either on their text sheet or label. All right, wait a minute. Basically, whatever the label says is what they're gonna, what I'm gonna use as far as the uh, stats, the titles, things like that. Um, but if I'm using a lower third, or something like that where I, I'm putting the word Carmenere on the screen, then I'm gonna use the French, um, the French way to spell it. All right, so I've had these wines for a while, like a minute or two minutes. Anyway, that's what happens when I can't say no, but I'm supposed to be studying for an exam and then commit to a lot of, uh, a lot of other personal stuff. Anyway, or a lot of in-person stuff. So now it's time to catch up with almost, well, 30 wines. Let's briefly catch up with the year so far. I did not pass the Court of Master Sommelier's theory exam or the, the uh, advanced theory exam. That means I don't take the other two portions due to several reasons. I don't expect to attempt it until 2026 at the earliest. One of those reasons is I needed to buy a new computer. You saw that computer in the Total Eclipse uh, series in my studio. Um, so I finally upgraded my late 2015 27-inch iMac to a new Mac Mini M2 Pro. M2 Pro, yeah. And uh, it was a very much needed upgrade. I'm very pleased with it. Uh, I've taken a break from studying and it's kind of weird now that I'm concentrating on making reviews for the next few months. I'll set most of my attention to uh, on completing my mapping project in Google Earth Pro. I should have the big stuff finished by the end of the year with the smaller stuff done by mid 2025 or earlier or later, I don't know. I'll record these reviews in a few multi-day sessions with the intent of at least recording everything by the end of July and then editing as needed. Okay, that's now that's out of the way. Let's talk Chilean wine. Way back in episode 99 of the WWTV era, the uh, current one that is, um, you know, Wine World TV era, I did a detailed segment on Chilean wine. Nothing has really changed from that, so if you want to know more about it, then hit the link in the description and watch the first seven minutes or so of that episode. Now, that episode's links also include a ton of resources. Okay, with that said, let's spend a few minutes on the grape Carmenere. It's the forgotten grape of Bordeaux. It's been around for quite a while, actually. While we don't know exactly when it appeared, we do know that it was mentioned in the late 1700s in France as a major grape in Bordeaux. We also know that its family tree is a bit complicated. It's a natural cross of Cabernet Franc and a grape that's not really cultiv very, cultivated very much called Gros Cabernet. You're probably seeing a Cabernet Sauvignon family tree right now from Jancis Robinson's Wine, Wine Grapes book. Link to this in the description below. This is important to understand how it relates to the other grapes of Bordeaux. I also talk about this in my California Cab uh, shootout video describing how each grape fits in a Bordeaux blend. Link below to that episode. Go to about eight minutes into it for the five minute story. 
So now we've established that Carmenier is related to Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc, and Merlot. Petit Verdot is a very distant cousin. Malbec is also related and is known as Cot. There is one connection I want to highlight, and that is pyrazine. While all the Bordeaux varieties have some kind of familial relationship, if you go back far enough, only some share the elevated level of pyrazine. They are roughly in order of most to least, Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc, and then Cabernet Sauvignon, Carmenere, Merlot. The others really don't, you know, Malbec and Petit Verdot don't have any direct connection to any pyrazinic grapes, so you won't find it in elevated levels. I bring this up because for many of us, that green bell pepper or jalapeno aroma and flavor is a distinguishing characteristic of the wines from these grapes. And over the years, that's been ripened out except for Sauvignon Blanc. It's still mostly present in wines from that grape, regardless of where the wine is made. What I will sometimes describe is a green quality with fern being a common description for like the red wines. So like I said, it's something that gets ripened out. As we have grapes that have become more ripe over the years due to the climate, certain characteristics become diminished. In addition to that, the green bell pepper that can be present seems to be less popular with most wine drinkers. It's considered off-putting, if you will. I personally love it, so I find that if it's not in a wine when I expect it, that it's missing something. Now don't get me wrong, I also don't want a wine that's singularly dominated by green bell pepper or jalapeno. It should be there, but not the star of the show. We'll see how many of these wines, I, you know, all the wines, um, will have it as Carmenere and Cabernet Sauvignon from Chile have traditionally had this characteristic in their wines. Oftentimes too much and more recently almost gone. Let's focus on its history in Chile, shall we? At some point in time, Carmenere found its way to Chile. It is thought to have arrived in the mid 1800s. For many years, it was thought to be Merlot. They looked enough alike to be confused with each other. This is actually more common than you think among grape varieties, especially in parts of the world where the grape variety isn't native. But even in those places, it can happen. In 1994, the French ampelographer Jean-Michel Bourriquot, I think I said it right, anyway, he figures out that there are both Carmenere and Merlot plantings in Chile. The first varietal bottling happens with the 1994 Carmen Grand Reserve Grande Vidur, released in 1996, using a synonym for Carmenere. But it's not until a year later, 1997, that the first bottle labeled as Carmenere is released as the 1996 Vina Santa Inez. After that, the Chilean wine industry seems to decide to make this their signature red grape along with Cabernet Sauvignon. Plantings peaked to about 13,750 hectares or about 40,000 acres by 2014. In 2017, there's a shift to what we call a terroir-driven shift in the style of wines. This is coming from a presentation about these wines from last year. Uh, yeah, last year. I, I've been putting off some of the, I hopefully even putting up some of the slides from it. Maybe not. I don't know. Anyway, these, uh, anyway, the clay soils tend to bring out the pyrazines. Hello, ripe bank Bordeaux and Cabernet Franc. And much of the Carmenere in Chile is planted along riverbeds rich in clay. So the overripening of the grape became a thing to reduce the pyrazine. Apparently now there's a focus to make Carmenere spicy again. Now from the presentation, I don't know if they mean green bell pepper and jalapeno or spicy fruity flavors as described in the presentation. I can say one of the things that distinguished Chilean Carmenere to me from say Chilean Cab is this similarity to enchiladas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, know, I know it sounds crazy, but cumin is frequently used in enchiladas. Like it's a required ingredient and I've identified that as my marker, or at least that's the descriptor I've used. Okay, just to clarify, sometimes cumin specifically mentioned, sometimes cumin is specifically mentioned in a recipe for enchiladas, and other times it's really just part of the chili powder you use. Anyway, I've smelled cumin on its own and that's, that, it's that, it's that aroma. It's that aroma. I'm telling you, man, it's there. Anyway, not every Chilean Carmenere has it. And if it does, it's usually because I don't get a large amount of bell pepper or jalapeno. So that's maybe where the spicy fruity flavors come from. And sure enough, cumin is part of the pyrazine family as long as it's roasted. Thank you, Wikipedia and Spice Pages for confirming that. There are links below so you can read all about that. Now that I've established some things here, let's talk about today's wine. It's coming from In Situ, 
which is part of Vina San Esteban. This is a free sample and I have free range to review it uh, however I wish, just like all the wines in this series. Located in Region 5 of San Esteban in the Aconcagua Valley, in situ Family Vineyards was founded in 1974 by Jose Vicente. I don't know exactly what Region 5 is as far as administratively, but they are located in the San Esteban DO, which is a sub-appellation of the Valle de Aconcagua. The San Esteban DO is in the Andes area of the Valle de Aconcagua. Remember that Chilean sub-appellations can be also divided into Andes, Entre Corrieras, which is between the mountains, and Costa, based on their relation to the Andes Mountains or the Pacific Ocean. Not all three areas are present as you go north to south. There was not every uh, major DO or major uh, wine growing area has all three, but frequently they will. Anyway, 20 years later, Jose and his son Horatio uh, made a radical move. Horatio, where are you at? Hi, Horatio. Yes, I know it's York. Okay. Anyway, the, the Halloween set is almost permanently over here. I just had to throw that in there. Uh, though anyway, they replanted their vineyards and built a modern winery in order to start making wine from their own grapes rather than sell them to other wineries. Uh, so Horatio studied enology at the University of Bordeaux and worked at both Chateau Mouton Rothschild and Mouton Cadet. He also worked at Chalon here in the States. So uh, you have two, anyway, not bad credentials, I might say, Horatio. Anyway, they have two main vineyards. The I'm going to probably butcher this. The Parahin, a Parahuin estate vineyards, and I'll probably put the spelling down there. And the La Florida estate. La Florida is where the winery is actually located. Its 57 hectares are along the Aconcagua River and is characterized by alluvial sandy soils. Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Carmenere, Syrah, Syrah, Petit Syrah, Cabernet Franc, Mourvedre, Petit Verdot, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, and Viognier are all planted there. To the southwest, also along the river, is the Patahuan Estate uh, Vineyard. This is a combination of hillside and valley plots. It has 90 hectares of rocky and clay soils. The mini mountain that's there rises about 300 feet above the rest of the area and was formed 65 to 99 million years ago at the same time as the Andes. Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Carmenere, Syrah, Sangiovese, Cabernet Franc, Malbec, Mouvedre, Petit Verdot, and Carignan are all planted there. They have two lines of wines, the Vigna San Esteban and In Situ. Their, the, the first is their value line. Um, in situ is their more premium line, though the price difference doesn't appear to be really that large. In addition, they are also certified sustainable under Chile's sustainability program. Let's get the stats for this wine. The 2021 Vigna San Esteban In Situ Carmenere Reserva suggested retail price $13. It's from the Valle de Aconcagua. 95% Carmenere, 5% Cabernet Sauvignon. Harvest is manual, fermentation in stainless steel. Maceration, 18 days, aging for 12 months in 50-50 French and American oak. The ABV is 13%. The total acidity is 5.42 grams per liter. The pH is 3.55. The RS is 3.4 grams per liter. That comes out to 0.51 grams per 150 milliliter serving. All right, make note that they do not use the San Esteban Dio on the label, even though they legally can, as far as I know. I've mentioned this in the past with wines from various places. We get caught up with learning those uh, more specific appellations, be it here in Chile or other countries. But at the end of the day, the general public doesn't really always know where they are. While the wineries of those areas want to differentiate themselves from others in a larger appellation, many of them end up not using it on their labels. And for you, quote, zero sugar people, this is zero, sorry, 0 0.01 grams above the legal limit of 0 0.5 grams per serving that the FDA considers a wine to be zero sugar. Just want to point that out. All right, let's get into the wine. I'm going to take a little swig here. All righty. Let me tell you something. These wines not just these six, but everything that I've had for a while, 
they've been teasing me for months. You know, you can drink these if you just just start writing reviews. So I admit it, I've been kind of lazy with um, really getting these reviews done. And I apologize to everybody who, sent, who has sent me samples, not just these samples, but all the samples that I have. I have a huge backlog of of wine to do. So my, I'm trying to be very committed to getting them done. Uh, well, <laughs> reality is probably going to be till next year. Some of these, some of these wines, but I might end up releasing two episodes a week somewhere along the line, just to kind of get, you know, just kind of catch things up. All right. Color looks great. Let's go ahead and smell it. So, you know, how I talk about that fern, that green, I, that's what I get. I don't get cumin. I don't get enchiladas per se. Um, I get red fruit. And it's, I guess you could call it spicy. So like a raspberry. There's a touch of garig and also smoke kind of. It's, it's got some like dried red fruit to it. Not, not, not uh, dry, like in desiccated, just drier uh, red fruit. Doesn't taste, doesn't smell sweet taste. Doesn't smell sweet. I haven't tasted it yet. Um, there is a touch of vanilla in here. Now that's getting a little air, but there is a general greenness to it. And I would, I would kind of, you know, sagebrush, um, you know, fern, just plants, you know, plant material, that type of stuff. And there was a hint of vanilla. Don't know how much of these oak barrels are new used, you know, how many uses they are. All right. There was like a, almost like a meat quality to it for like a very fleeting second. Let's go ahead and just uh, taste it. So pretty much the aromas have carried through onto the, onto the tasting. Red fruit, it's raspberry, drier in nature. Um, not, not dried out, but drier in nature. Um, ripe, but drier. And there's a bit of dustiness too. And that fern, that green has come through. It's not, it's not loads of pyrazine in here. Like it's not like screaming at the top of his lungs that it's got bell pepper and jalapeno, nor do I really get the, oh my goodness, I, I, it reminds me of enchiladas. Um, however, since I know what's in here, I could see having it with enchiladas or just really lots of other cool things. But it was, uh, it's, it's somewhat juicy. Even though I said it was dried fruit, it's, it, there's also a, a, a juiciness. It's a little contradictory there. Um, but a little bit of dustiness. I don't really get the vanilla so much on the, on the palate. Now that things are, the juices are flowing, the acids are going and the palate is adjusting. There's a little more things going on here. There is a bit of that pyrazinic quality. There, there was like the briefest hint of a cumin thing, but still is more fern, more green leafy things coming to the forefront. And besides the raspberry, I got a touch of strawberry, a uh, touch of cranberry. So it's all red fruited. I don't get any darker fruits. I don't get any blacker, purple or blue fruit in here. Though it did have, what did it have? Did it have Cabernet Franc in it? Five, what was the 5%? Oh, Cabernet Sauvignon. So, I mean, if there was, if there was going to be like, say, um, like a little bit of blackberry, it would be very, very minor. I'm going to say the, the Cabernet Sauvignon might be just adding some tan into it. It isn't super tannic, but it's a little bit there. The mouth is kind of drying out. There's a smoothness to it. There's a little bit of a silkiness to it, but there is a rusticity to it. And I get that a lot from Chilean wines, or rusticity, not in a negative sort of way. I also get rusticity from Texas wines and Spanish wines. Um, so, but it, it's, it's a little bit there, but yeah. So I'm going to really briefly talk about why something will smell and taste differently, the, the pH in your mouth will, will change the esters. Will, will cha not change, but will change what you perceive. Um, so there are things, there are faults in wine that you will never smell, but when you put it in your mouth, um, the pH of your mouth um, releases these aromas that go back up into your olfactory and you will taste them rather than smell them. So um, that's why there's such a different, there can be, a difference or enhancement if you can't smell it if you taste it 
you, you might get that because sometimes it just extra release. It's a tasty wine. Uh, it's what, 17, 18 bucks, right? Um, you know, I think it's well priced. Oh, no, 13. Oh, God, yeah, 13. Even better priced. Um, and so I made a mention that their other ones didn't seem to be that much of a different price point. Like when I looked up their other stuff, I think they sell, only sell for like three or four bucks less. So while this might be another step up, it's not like, you know, going from 10 bucks to 20 or 25 or 30. It's tasty. I really enjoy it. All right. Well, that's going to do it for today's wine. Um, if you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe and then tell your friends and we'll see you next time with some more Chilean Carmenere, please.